lines on the listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. And if you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I want to like to hand the conference to your speaker today, Dave Hughes, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, operator, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on our third quarter earnings call. Uh, start off, I'm going to introduce uh, the senior management we have here in our virtual room. Uh, we have Brad Corson, Chairman, President, and CEO. Dan Lyons, Senior Vice President, Finance and Administration. Teresa Radburn, Senior Vice President of Commercial and Corporate Development. And Simon Younger, Senior Vice President of the Upstream. As usual, I'm going to start with the cautionary statement and note that today's comments may contain forward-looking information. Any forward-looking information is not a guarantee of future performance, and actual future financial and operating results can differ materially depending on a number of factors and assumptions. Forward-looking information and the risk factors and assumptions are described in further detail in our second quarter earnings press release that we, or sorry, third quarter earnings press release that we issued this morning, as well as our most recent Form 10-K. And all these documents are available on Cedar, Edgar, and on our website. So please refer to those. Uh, our format is going to follow our usual format. Uh, we'll start with some opening remarks from Brad, and then Dan will take us through the financial results, and then we'll go back to Brad for an operational update. Uh, once that's done, we'll then move to the Q&A. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brad. All right. Thank you, Dave. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our third quarter 2020 earnings call. I hope each of you and your families are continuing to stay healthy as we continue to manage through these challenging times. While the third quarter continued to present challenges related to the current pandemic and overall economic environment, we certainly saw material improvement over the second quarter. And I'm pleased to say that we continue to demonstrate our ability to adapt to the changed environment and deliver significantly improved results, a testament to the resilience of our company. Our strong balance sheet and level of integration coupled with the significant progress we've made towards delivering on our expense and capital spending reductions has underpinned our performance over the past several months, performance that continues to improve month over month. As I've said before, the company is well positioned to capture the value of improving market conditions going forward. The health and safety of our employees and contractor workforce continues to be our top priority. And as we've been doing since the, this global pandemic began, we continue to take COVID-19 mitigation steps at all of our operating facilities and office locations. And finally, I'd also, also like to take this opportunity to once again express our deep, deep appreciation and gratitude for all those working on the front lines of this global pandemic. We can't thank them enough for the sacrifices they are making to keep us all safe and provide us with our essential services. So now let's talk about the third quarter results. While ongoing lower than normal global demand continues to impact crude oil and product prices, we did see demands improve materially through the quarter. And that improvement coupled with the steps we're taking to reduce our expenses and reduce our capital program resulted in significantly better financial results versus the second quarter. Earnings for the quarter were $3 million, which represents an increase of $529 million versus the second quarter of this year, reflecting improvement in all of our business segments. With the improving market conditions and our continuing focus on reducing costs and driving efficiencies across the organization, we were able to achieve positive earnings in what continues to be a challenging environment. And this was despite being impacted by substantial turnaround activities in the quarter and a two-week unplanned outage of a third-party pipeline supplying diluent to curl. And while three million may not seem like a big number, it's a positive number. And that speaks volumes in this business environment. And as you will see, the organization continues to make excellent progress towards identifying and delivering even more efficiencies. At the end of March, we committed to delivering spending reductions totaling $1 billion, which included a $500 million reduction in capital spending, as well as $500 million in lower expenses. 
As of the end of the quarter, our production and manufacturing expenses are down $813 million versus the first nine months of 2019, helping us to surpass our expense reduction target. And our capital spending is down over 50% a savings of over $700 million versus the first nine months of 2019. Both of these results show we are significantly outpacing these targets. And given this progress, we're now further lowering our latest annual CapEx guidance to about $900 million, a reduction of around $250 million from the midpoint of our previous guidance of $1.1 to $1.2 billion. Moving to operations, as I mentioned, we did see demand start to recover in the quarter. And as a result, we saw improvement in both our upstream and downstream production and throughput volumes. I would remind you that in the quarter, we also made conscious decisions to advance and extend planned turnarounds to better align volumes with demand challenges and to protect the health and safety of our workforce. As in the second quarter, I'm pleased to tell you that the organization was able to complete this significant plan turnaround activity safely and at lower costs. Now that our major plan maintenance for the year is behind us in both the upstream and downstream, we are well positioned to capitalize on any further recovery as the fourth quarter unfolds. And of special note is the performance at Curl despite the added challenge of a two-week outage of Interpipeline's Polaris system, which supplies diluent to the site, Curl's performance was nothing short of outstanding. But more on that in just a few minutes. Cash generated from operating activities in the quarter was $875 million, an increase of almost $1.7 billion versus the second quarter. After the first nine months of the year, Imperial has generated nearly $500 million of cash from operating activities. Our capital expenditures were $141 million in the quarter, and as you may know, we declared a quarterly dividend this morning of $0.22 cents per share, which is unchanged versus the last quarter. I think it's important to highlight that even as we continue to manage through a challenging market environment, our financial resilience, operational strength and flexibility and focus on cost reduction opportunities allowed us to cover our capital spending and our dividend with our operating cash flow, both pre and post working capital. All in, we saw an increase of almost 600 million of cash on hand, and we ended the quarter with 817 million of cash on the balance sheet. So at this point, I'm gonna pause and turn it over to Dan to go through our financial performance for the quarter in more detail. Thanks, Brad. Our third quarter net income was $3 million compared to net income of $424 million in the third quarter of 2019. The decrease was driven by lower crude prices, lower refining margins, and lower volumes associated with COVID-19. These negative impacts were partially offset by the substantial reductions in production and manufacturing expenses mentioned by Brad. Looking sequentially, Results improved $529 million from the second quarter of 2020, which included a non-cash gain of $281 million associated with the reversal of an inventory write-down we took in the first quarter of 2020. Excluding this non-cash item, we saw a sequential quarter improvement of $810 million driven by improved market conditions across all our businesses and supported by sustained cost reductions. Looking at performance by business line, Upstream recorded a net loss of $74 million in the third quarter of 2020, up $370 million compared to a net loss of $444 million in the second quarter, or an increase of about $600 million, excluding the non-cash gain of about $230 million in the Upstream associated with the reversal of an inventory valuation charge in the second quarter. Higher realizations improved results by about $530 million, and higher volumes added about $90 million. Turning to the downstream, net income of $77 million in the third quarter was up about $110 million compared to a net loss 
of $32 million in the second quarter. Again, excluding the non-cash gain in the second quarter of about $50 million for the downstream, results improved about $160 million sequentially. The increase was mainly driven by higher margins and volumes. And finally, our chemicals business continued its positive contribution, earning $27 million in the third quarter of 2020, compared to $7 million in the second quarter. This increase was primary, primarily driven by stronger margins. Looking at cash flow, as Brad noted, sequentially cash generated from operating activities improved almost $1.7 billion from the second quarter of 2020 to the third quarter. Cash generated from operating activities was $875 million in the third quarter compared to cash used in operating activities of $816 million in the second quarter. Second quarter cash generation had a negative working capital impact of $170 million, while third quarter cash generation included a favorable working capital impact of $485 million. With this strong performance, our debt balance remained stable while our cash balance grew by $600 million as we ended the quarter with $817 million of cash on hand. Beyond our cash balance, Imperial's liquidity continues to be supported by substantial undrawn credit facilities, an industry-leading credit rating, and ready access to commercial paper and term debt markets. Moving on to CapEx. Capital expenditures in the third quarter totaled $141 million, down about $60 million from the second quarter. Year-to-date capital expenditures totaled $679 million, down $720 million from the same period of 2019, well ahead of our commitment to reduce CapEx by $500 million. As Brad noted, we expect our full-year CapEx spend to be around $900 million, down from our previous guidance of $1.1 to $1.2 billion. Reduced year-to-date spending compared to last year is associated with the completion of the curl crushers, lower unconventional CapEx, the suspension of the Aspen project, and lower spending in the downstream. Regarding dividends, in the third quarter, we paid $162 million in dividends at $0.22 cents a share, compared to $169 million at $0.22 cents per share in the third quarter of 2019. As Brad mentioned, earlier today, we announced a fourth quarter dividend of $0.22 cents per share. Now I'll turn it back to Brad. All right. Thanks, Dan. So now let's move on and talk about operational performance for the quarter, starting with production. Upstream production averaged 365,000 oil equivalent barrels a day in the third quarter. And while volumes were down 42,000 barrels per day versus the third quarter of 2019, this was mainly due to the advancement and extension of the second curl turnaround, as well as the third-party diluent pipeline outage I mentioned earlier. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. These results also reflect a production increase of 18,000 oil equivalent barrels per day versus the second quarter of this year. And once again, we took the opportunity to optimize our maintenance plans in the current environment by advancing and extending the work both at Curl and Syncrude. So now let's move on and talk about each asset specifically starting with Curl. In the third quarter, we produced 189,000 barrels a day on a gross basis at Curl, down from 224,000 barrels per day in the third quarter of 2019, but essentially flat with the second quarter of this year. Last year, as has been typical, we carried out our second planned turnaround in late September, with only a couple weeks impacting the third quarter production. This year, however, given the business environment, we opted to advance this turnaround and extend it, taking approximately six weeks to complete the work, but entirely within the third quarter. This allowed us to better manage the health and safety of our workforce through appropriate physical distancing, but it also allowed us to complete the work at a significantly lower cost. Also impacting CURL in the quarter, as I mentioned, was the outage on the pipeline that supplies diluent to curl, which occurred at the end of August. Shortly after the outage, we were forced to shut down production operations at curl. 
Ultimately, the line was put back in service after the installation of a temporary bypass, around two weeks after it was first shut down. Upon commissioning of the bypass, we were able to get Curl back up to full rates quite quickly. In fact, I'd like to highlight the extraordinary efforts the Imperial team took to mitigate the impacts of the outage. They very quickly activated alternative diluent supply options for the site and were able to establish a level of supply that allowed us to restart one of the trains at minimal levels during the outage. These actions ultimately limited the impact on curl production for the quarter to around 41,000 barrels per day on a gross basis. I would also note that in the absence of the pipeline outage, we would have delivered our strongest quarter of 2020 at curl. I commented earlier that our third quarter production at curl was flat versus the second quarter, despite the fact that the site experienced a still you pipeline outage. And you may be asking if we did our math correctly, but I will assure you that we, ha we have done it correctly. If you recall back on the second quarter earnings call, I commented on how well the asset performed in the window between the two turnarounds, averaging over 300,000 barrels per day. I'm pleased to say that this performance has continued since the pipeline was put back in service. This helped us to offset the production loss due to the pipeline issue. I also mentioned on the second quarter call that despite the significant extension of our planned turnaround, Curl was still able to deliver a first half production record. I can tell you now that post the pipeline outage, Curl continues to set new production records, delivering an average production rate of 313,000 barrels a day over the four-week period from restart until mid-October. And through the month of October, we have delivered average production of around 300,000 barrels per day. With this performance in mind, and despite the unexpected pipeline challenges, we are reiterating our annual production guidance of around 220,000 barrels per day for curl. And now that we've successfully completed our planned maintenance work at Curl, we have the opportunity to finish the year strong. I can't tell you just how excited I am to see what Curl can do over an extended period of time, and we've gotten a window of that in October. And I'm particularly pleased to see that the government of Alberta has lifted production quotas for the month of December, and hopefully forever as that removes a potential obstacle to demonstrating CURL's true performance potential. And finally with CURL, an update on operating costs, which is another great story. Unit production and manufacturing expenses at the site are down about 25% versus the same period in 2019. We continue to track well ahead of the $4 per barrel reduction we committed to for 2020 and are within striking distance of the $20 per barrel, uh, U.S. dollar per barrel future target we previously communicated. We'll talk more specifically about that next step in our cost journey at our upcoming investment day, but I am very excited by the potential here. Now moving on to Cold Lake. Production at Cold Lake was 130000 barrels per day for the quarter, which is up 8,000 barrels per day versus the second quarter when we had planned turnaround work at our Mohican plant. This work carried into early July. Year-to-date production and manufacturing expenses at Cold Lake are down around 5% as a result of the cost efficiencies we've been focusing on there. And at the end of the second quarter, we guided full-year production at Cold Lake would be around 135,000 barrels per day, and we still view this as about where we will end up the year. At Syncrude, we saw an average production of 67,000 barrels per day in terms of imperial share in the third quarter, which was similar to the same quarter last year, and 17,000 barrels per day higher than the second quarter of this year. 
The increase versus the second quarter reflects the completion of planned maintenance work at this facility. You will recall that the site started the majority of their turnaround work in the second quarter, but extended some of that work to late September. The asset continued to move forward with the bi-directional pipeline, and construction was nearly complete at the end of the third quarter. Commissioning will take place in the fourth quarter, and as you know, this project will provide improved operational flexibility for Syncrude, supporting increased reliability and utilization. So now let's move to the downstream. We refined an average of 341,000 barrels a day in the quarter, which was up significantly from the 278,000 barrels a day for the second quarter of this year. The 63,000 barrels per day improvement was driven primarily by improving product demands and reduced planned maintenance in the third quarter. The throughput of 341,000 barrels per day equates to a utilization of around 81%, which is fairly consistent with what the Canadian industry was seeing in the quarter. We also completed significant turnaround work in the quarter related to the coker at Sarnia. This work was predominantly in the second quarter, but did carry over into the third quarter, all of it in an environment of fairly narrow, light, heavy spreads. With the completion of this turnaround work, we remain well positioned to respond to improving product demands and potentially some widening of light, heavy spreads. As we discussed last quarter, the adjustments we made to our 2020 planned maintenance schedules and scopes of work have contributed to the cost efficiencies that downstream has been able to deliver. Year-to-date production and manufacturing expenses are down around 17% versus the first three quarters of 2019. While I've commented on the improvements we saw in the demand for petroleum products, it's important to note that demands are still not completely back to normal. This continued uncertainty makes it difficult to forecast utilization for the fourth quarter. I'm also pleased to announce that our cogen project at Strathcona is now complete, with commissioning starting in late September, and the unit is now fully online. The, the cogen unit will produce 41 megawatts of power enough to meet approximately 75 to 80 percent of Strathcona's needs and will significantly decrease energy consumption from the Alberta grid. Now, not only will this deliver operating cost reductions, but environmental benefits as well, reducing province-wide greenhouse gas emissions by approximately 112,000 112, tons per year, equivalent to removing around 24,000 vehicles from the road. Consistent with what we saw in refinery utilization in the quarter, petroleum product sales increased 92,000 barrels per day versus the second quarter and came in at 449,000 barrels per day. Again, this reflects a level of demand recovery for these products, but demands are still not back to what we would consider normal levels. So now a bit more on industry demands for the various products we make and sell. As a reminder, on the first quarter call at the end of April, I mentioned we were seeing demand reductions in the range of 56 to 60 percent on motor gasoline, 20 to 30 percent on diesel, and 80 to 90 percent on jet. Today, I would say that across the country, we are seeing total industry demand for both motor gasoline and diesel much closer to normal levels, although the ongoing challenges due to COVID-19 are certainly driving some volatility. However, jet demand continues to lag significantly, although it is experiencing a slow recovery. At this point, I would estimate jet demand to be around 50% of normal. Our chemical business saw improved earnings in the quarter with $27 million of earnings. This business continues to be profitable in the current market, with the third quarter being the strongest so far this year. Volumes improved versus the second quarter and continue to track very closely with 2019 as COVID-related impacts 
have not been significant. Margins continue to be tight, but we did see material improvement versus the second quarter of this year. And just before I wrap up, I'd like to take the opportunity to recognize that 2020 represents the 140th anniversary of Imperial Oil. In fact, on September 8, 1880, 16 oil refiners in Ontario joined forces to create the company, and since then we have been delivering first in the industry. In fact, the first service station, the industry's first petroleum research department, and a decades-long association with hockey, including sponsoring the first radio broadcast of Hockey Night in Canada and sponsoring the NHL's three stars, both of those starting in 1936. Imperial continues to be a leader in applying technology and innovation to responsibly develop and deliver Canada's energy resources. I want to recognize and thank all of the employees of Imperial Oil for the last 140 years. It's their creativity, determination, and resilience that has allowed Imperial to manage through significant changes and challenges over the decades, be that world wars, changing consumer requirements, or pandemics, but always coming out stronger. And I'd also like to thank our business partners and customers who have been with us the whole way. We look forward to a strong and prosperous future together. So to wrap up, another tough quarter, but once again, our financial strength and resilience supported improved earnings and cash flow, and we delivered strong operational results, most notably at Curl. We've also surpassed the capital and expense reduction commitments we made earlier this year as the entire organization continues to rise to the challenge. But we aren't done yet we're gonna to continue to find more. And as in the second quarter, we continue to demonstrate our commitment to shareholder returns by maintaining our dividend in the quarter. So when you add all that up, coupled with the fact that our key turnaround activities for the year are behind us, Imperial has substantial momentum as we approach the end of the year. We are well positioned to take advantage of any further recovery in the fourth quarter. So I'll pause there and I'll turn it over to Dave to facilitate the Q&A session. Okay, thanks Brad. <clears throat> Operator, um, we'll take the first question now. All right, as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, you need to press star one on your telephone. Our first question will come from the line of Neil Mehta from Goldman Sachs. You may begin. Good, good morning, team. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, the first question uh, I had was just around uh, capital intensity and spend. Uh, it was exceptionally uh, low in the quarter, uh, and, and capital intensity was uh, was very good here. But I, I would imagine that's not a run rate type of uh, uh, capex number. Can you just kind of help us understand uh, what was it that uh, drove spend lower? And then give us an early preview of what 2021 spend could look like, recognizing uh, you got an analyst day here in a couple of days. Yeah, Neil, thanks for that question. Well, you know, in, in terms of the, the current spend rate, I think that's very much reflective of both the proactive steps we have taken to manage capital uh, to ensure we're focused on the most uh, – the, the highest priority projects, the highest value projects, but at the same time be selective, uh, recognizing the business environment that we are in today. Um, we have been focused on our sustaining capital, uh, but also limiting our focus on growth, but being mindful that we want to be well positioned uh, for an eventual recovery in the market. Capital expenditures has also been impacted by our ability to execute work. Um, we want to ensure the safety and, and health of all of our workforce, employees and contractors, and that in many cases dictates uh, how quickly we can execute work, uh, how many 
uh, workers we can have on site at any one time, what sort of distancing is appropriate, and all that impacts pace of activity. Uh, so it's really a combination of that selectivity, uh, capital discipline, but also um, execution pace that is driving the levels we see today. We're quite comfortable with those levels, um, and, and that's the reason for our revised guidance uh, so that we can reflect that to the market. You know, as we look ahead to next year, I would expect uh, some increase in, in levels of capital spending versus that $900 million, uh, which will be driven both by, you know, our view that we will be able to uh, improve execution pace as we move out of uh, this pandemic. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there are some some key activities that, that we will resume and continue to focus on in, uh, in 2021. So I hope that's helpful for you. And, and as you said, our investor day coming up, and, and we'll give you much more more clarity on that plan uh, in November. No, that that's really helpful, and I, I don't want uh, you you to to preview too much here. But if you just think at a very high level, 2020 versus 2021, what are the incremental projects that are are at the top of um, the top of the queue for you, where you would think that 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 would bridge the spend higher and. And why do you think those are good projects that um, that would drive returns higher over time? Well, Neil, I think you know a, a lot of the projects are a continuation of things we already have um, in the portfolio and that we're already working on. So it's continued advancement of those projects. Um, we, we we do have some some additional projects on the horizon, but. I think I'd rather uh, wait until investor day so we can get into those in more detail with you and, and be able to fully describe the benefits and how they fit into our strategic work plan. Great. Can I, can I sneak one more in here, uh, which is just your thoughts on, on the refining environment and particularly, um, you know, utilization at, at Imperial was, was certainly better than a lot of your U.S. peers. Talk about how you think uh, downstream uh, plays out in Canada from here, and then also talk about um, crude and feedstock and, and um, whether, um, you know, the profitability of those assets in an environment where, where light crude, particularly thin crude, could be pretty tight. Yeah, well, you know, to, to describe the outlook for, for refining, it's, it's really driven by demand um, and you know, so where are we with demand? As, as as I described, for for gasoline and diesel, we we have seen uh, significant recovery versus where we were, kind of at the, the the lowest point in the second quarter. We're still short of uh, historical demands. Uh, you know, by a few percentage points uh, for for each of those products. And, and then, of course, jet, as I mentioned, you know, we, we are far below historical demand. So the, the, the real driver for refinery utilization for us is going to be, you know, what happens with demand going forward. Um, we had been on a, a trajectory of pretty steady demand improvements across all those products, you know, uh, through the end of the third quarter. But and now as we uh, find ourselves in the fourth quarter and, you know, very unfortunately, as we're experiencing in Canada, but also in the U.S. and, and key countries around the world, you know, there, there is a significant increase in, in COVID cases. Um, and, and so that is causing, you know, a change in, in behaviors again. Uh, so the question is, you know, what, what impact will that have? And how long will it last? And and we just don't know that. Um, you know, we're we're obviously hopeful that we'll see demand continue that will allow us to uh, to achieve these sort of utilization rates, if not higher. Uh, but it'd be premature to commit to that. Um, you know, in, in terms of crude and feedstock. Um, you know, our Canadian refineries are are well positioned. 
to take advantage of uh, lower cost um, uh, crude streams, you know, here in Canada that gives us an advantage often versus uh, U.S. refineries. Um, we also have uh, some level of integration with our own production operations, and that also gives us some advantages. Uh, so with that integration, you know, uh, we, we continue to be optimistic about, about the future for our downstream business. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Our next question will come from line of Asset Send from Bank of America. You may begin. Thanks. Good morning. Um, so uh, just following up on your uh, commentary on CapEx, uh, Brad, uh, you've gone through all the major turnarounds uh, that are now behind you, and then with all these uh, impressive uh, costs and efficiency gains, particularly at Coral, uh, how – how would you characterize your sustaining CapEx as we get into 2021? Um, how would you characterize that? Well, I think the, the sustaining CapEx we're looking at in 2021 is going to be, you know, comparable to, uh, to what we've seen in historic levels. Um, you know, and I, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll let Dan kind of chime in with, with some more specifics. But, um, you know, we, we see those, those uh, sustaining CapEx levels as, as being quite appropriate to, to maintain the viability of, of the business and allow us to continue to deliver these, these strong uh, reliability and, and, uh, and overall performance results. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, if you're looking for more quantification as, as we move to next year. Um, again, I, I don't really want to share any, any new targets in, until we get to investor day. Okay, that's, that's fair, uh, Brad. And then uh, a bigger picture question. I mean, we're seeing uh, a lot of changes uh, in, in the industry, both um, in the U.S. and uh, in Canada. And th your thoughts on M&A, um, and how do you see – opportunities uh, as it relates to Imperial, and uh, what do you see as the potential impediments to this uh, wave of consolidation that we're seeing right now? Well, you're exactly right. There, there is a lot of activity in that space uh, recently, both, both in the U.S. And, and, of course, Canada. For, for Imperial, as I've said before, and it's, it's really no, no change, you know, we continue to keep the aperture open uh, for any, you know, select uh, uniquely accretive and strategic opportunities uh, that that may be available. But honestly, our focus right now is maximizing the profitability of our existing portfolio of assets. And so, you know, that's what we're doing. You know, I, I highlighted. Uh, some of the activities at, at Curl as, as an example of that. Um, talked about Strathcona, the CoGen, uh, completing all the turnaround activities, and all these you know structural improvements in operating costs and our discipline around capital. All that is you know fundamentally lowering the break even of of our existing assets and and allows us to increase our cash flows. And, and we think that is critically important in, in this business environment. So that's our priority. Um, but again, we, we've got an eye on, you know, the aperture is open for, for any potential M&A, but, but that's not our priority. Um, and we don't, we don't need M&A, um, you know, given we've got a, a deep portfolio of, of future growth projects as well. Um, but, you know, the market is evolving, and, and that is causing, you know, new assets to, uh, to come into play, and so it's important to keep an eye on it. You know, in terms of impediments, you know, I think it comes down to um, what I've talked about before, and, and that is our potential uh, sellers and potential buyers able to align on value and, and future views of what the market will be. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, do, do the bot, potential buyers have the financial strength 
to take on more assets. And and so today, you know, there's a, probably a limited pool of, of potential buyers. Appreciate the color. Thanks, Brad. Yep, thank you, Essence. Thank you. Our next question will come from line of Greg Party from RBC Capital Markets. You may begin. Yeah, thanks. Thank, thanks. Good morning. Um, Brad, with, with Alberta now, you know, lifting curtailment as you, um, uh, as you pointed towards, uh, I'm just wondering what that means for curl, but as opposed to a broad question, because I know it means higher rates, but could you remind us maybe uh, just on n not so much the calendar stream capacity, because I think that's 240,000, but maybe just what daily capacity rates are and, and even perhaps what some of the highest rates that you've achieved, e even if over short periods of time. I'm just trying to get an understanding as to whether, you know, the, the asset certainly sounds like it's operating extremely well, and I'm, I'm wondering if that 240 is going to begin to glide up with time. It's a great, great question, Greg. And so first, let me start with a comment about curtailment. Um, certainly, we are delighted uh, and quite pleased that the Alberta government has uh, kind of lifted uh, the quotas for December. Um, we think that's a very uh, necessary step, a prudent step. Uh, I would argue an overdue step. Uh, but but very pleased to see that they have taken that step. Um, I, I do view it as as a partial uh, remedy, though. Uh, I very much would like to see the government uh, proceed with eliminating curtailment altogether, because I think you know even while it's suspended, it creates this overhang of uncertainty for the industry as it relates to future growth investments. And so I think in order to fully address that going forward, you know, it would, it would be quite appropriate for the government to, uh, to remove that, uh, that requirement altogether. Um, but I am pleased with the first step. Um, and so then as we think about how does that affect us, um, not having a, uh, a quota in December looking forward for for curls performance you know as, as I described uh, uh, curl has has performed extremely well since mid-september uh, to this four-week uh, running record of 313,000 barrels a day I think that's a strong indication of the potential of curl uh, for the month of October, as I mentioned, uh, we'll probably see something more like 300,000. So we, we clearly have the potential to exceed 280,000 barrels a day that we've indicated in the past. The question, of course, is how all that kind of lines out over the course of a year where we have seasonal variations, we have turnarounds and other maintenance activities that we have to account for. Um, and that'll be, I think, a key topic for us on Investor Day to share with you what our latest profiles look like. Um, but needless to say, we continue to feel very encouraged and optimistic about CURL's capability. And so I expect you'll see us continue to raise our, our views and, and targets for that asset. Okay. Okay, good to know. Thanks for that. So we've gone, you know, let's go from kind of the best to maybe an asset that's still not, you know, meeting its objectives. So with Syncrude, uh, you know, the bidirectional pipeline, as you mentioned here, is, is, is teed up. That's great from a redundancy, feedstock redundancy standpoint. Um, curious as to whether you think the bidirectional pipeline puts you in better stead than to achieve the 90% utilization rate, but at the same time, uh, from an operating cost perspective, is, is it going to be enough or is this a situation where you really need to begin to take absolute costs out of the equation? Well, a couple of comments on, on Syncrude. Um, you know, first of all, I, I do think the bi-directional uh, pipeline is a significant enabler for that asset. Um, you know, having 
that capability um, that provides additional flexibility uh, for the asset, um, you know, allows greater utilization, I think is really important uh, both to volumes performance but also cost, unit cost performance. So, so I'm, I'm really excited about getting that line, uh, you know, commissioned and started up by the end of the year. Um, is it enough to achieve our volumes and cost targets? I would say no. Um, you know, it's certainly a contributor, um, but we need Syncru to continue uh, to look for ways to drive their cost structure lower and continue to look for other ways to, uh, to improve their, their utilization. Uh, you know, 2019, I think, was a really good year. Uh, for Syncrude and I think demonstrated what is potential. Um, you know, obviously a, a, a lot of uh, unfortunate circumstances this year uh, that has hindered that asset, uh, but hopefully once we get past uh, the COVID implications, get past this year, get the bi-directional pipeline on, continue to support from uh, from all of the owners to ensure we're, we're leveraging our individual experiences and bringing that to the asset. Hopefully all those things together will, will get us back on a path of continued uh, uh, performance, continued cost efficiency. Uh, that, that's critically important for that asset. Oh, okay, last one for me, and I'm going to sneak it in like Neil did. Um, do you think Syncrude recognizes that it's 80% percent owned by Suncor and, and Imperial? Or is it still because it's just your reference to, you know, Syncrude has to kind of do this, but at the end of the day, you two guys own it. Do you think there's the recognition internally at that organization that it's now an operating asset? I think very much it's recognized. You know, we, we have a joint owners uh, committee uh, that works very closely with Syncrude. I think there, there's clear recognition of, of everybody's role and, and their uh, commitment to achieve our mission together. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's been a hard road, but, uh, but everybody recognizes what the potential is, and they're all working together to achieve that. Terrific. Thanks a lot, Brad. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. And our next question will come from the line of Benny Wong from Morgan Stanley. You may begin. Hey, good morning, team. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, just wanted to follow up around the cost reductions, uh, which looks like you've exceeded your, your target of $500 million. Can you provide any color thoughts of where maybe your initiative exceeded your original expectations uh, and any thoughts of what number that will ultimately be by year end? And, you know, any early thoughts in terms of how we think about the potential for more in 2021? I think, you know, you mentioned the co-gen unit. Uh, would the cost savings of that be, be something incremental that shows up next year? It's, it's a great question, Benny. And, you know, um, I'm quite proud of the organization and what, what they've achieved uh, since the beginning of the year and, and since we set that target of, of $500 million, um, you know, we, we are far outpacing that target. You know, as I mentioned, um, you know, for, for operating costs, we're, we're already $813 million, uh, below where we were in, in 2019. And, and honestly, it's, it's difficult to point out, you know, one specific place because it, it's really across the board. Uh, every single asset is demonstrating uh, lower costs this year. Um, and, and likewise, in our, in our corporate uh, headquarters, we're also delivering lower costs. So, so everybody is contributing to that success. Um, you know, I, I, I highlighted the, the curl unit cost just as an example of, of where we've made just, just great improvements. Um, and, and uh, you know, so there we had indicated we we're going to try to achieve a $4 per barrel reduction this year. You know, we're already well ahead of that and, and close to achieving our $20 per barrel uh, longer-term goal. Um, 
But you know what what's driving that? All these efficiencies, all these cost savings. You know, it's it's a combination of of selectivity of what we work on. It's it's a combination of uh, of applying technology. Um, you know, it's making smart choices. Uh, we, we have had uh, reductions in our in our contractor workforce, and, and that's contributing. So, you know, it's a wide variety of things. But most importantly, it's it's across all assets, and and we expect to carry a significant amount of those savings into next year. Great, that's very helpful, Brad. Thank you. Um, my follow up is just wanted to get your thoughts, high level thoughts around. You know the recent headline news that we've seen around Sonovus acquiring Husky. What do you what do you think that means for the industry? And if you think that is an indication that you know we could see some more oil sands M and A, or is that more of a very unique situation between those two companies? Thank you. Well, I think you know we we all woke up to a little bit of a surprise on that Sunday morning when, when it was announced. Um, you know, I, I have no clue as to how long they've been talking to each other. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised that we are starting to see some M&A. You know, we've, we have been at relatively stable prices, you know, for the last uh, four months now probably. And, and as I've said in the past, you know, the biggest challenge is uh, – buyers and sellers aligning on price, but when price stabilizes, that, that helps to converge. Um, you know, I think every transaction is unique, and, and I don't think you should read too much into one transaction as to, to what it means for, for other, other transactions. Um, you know, there, there may be more, there, there may, be, may not be, um, you know, especially now as, as prices have have fallen the you know a, a couple of dollars a barrel that may cause people to step back and, and think more about it. So so time time will tell, Benny. Um, Great, thanks, Brad. Thank you. And we have another question for the line of Mike Dunn from Stiefel First Energy. You may begin. Thank you. Um, my question is on Cold Lake. Um, I'm just wondering if the Q3 volumes were impacted negatively at all by by curtailments, um, perhaps as you ramped up curl in September, and whether or not that's uh, going to be an issue for you in, in Q4 if you if you try to shoot the lights out um, uh, at, at curl uh, in, at least in October and November while cur there, there are still curtailments in place. Um, just by my math, I think you'd, you'd need to get closer to 150 for Q4 to, at Curl to, to um, hit your annual guidance. And I think you had talked us kind of down to 140-ish or, or lower per year as the kind of current outlook. Yeah, for, for Cold Lake in the third quarter, we did not have any uh, curtailment impacts. Um, you know, and, and we delivered that 131,000 barrels per day for the quarter, which was up from the second quarter. You know, second quarter we had our turnaround uh, at, at one of our key uh, plants there, the Mohican plant. As, as I recall, there might have been some additional minor maintenance uh, that carried into the third quarter. You know, we're, we're currently uh, producing at volumes uh, Notably higher than that 131, and really more in line with our prior guidance we had given of uh, of around 135,000 barrels a day, and, and we still feel still feel good about that guidance for for the rest of the year, um, and uh, and and are not concerned about uh, about curtailment, you know, in the month of November, and then of course the quota goes away in December. Right. Okay, thanks, Brad. That's all for me. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Mike. Okay, and Brad, we did have a couple of questions come in ahead of time, which I'll, I'll read out. The first one comes from Matt Murphy from Tudor Pickering Holt. 
seeing a number of renewable biodiesel projects picking up around the world and in the U.S. Appreciate that part of this is largely a function of less profitability, but can you speak to these projects as a potential opportunity for Imperial in Canada, whether that be uh, from an economics perspective or through an ESG lens? Thanks for that question, Matt. Um, we're always looking for projects that can efficiently deliver value to our shareholders, and there are are a number of different ways we, that we can participate in renewable fuels. In fact, we, we already blend ethanol and renewable diesel at a number of our terminals. And as you may be aware, we offer products like our Synergy gasoline and diesel efficient that allow our customers to improve their fuel efficiency and, and reduce emissions. So, so th this is clearly a focus for us. Um, and we continue to look at uh, other opportunities that can maximize our renewable volumes to reduce emissions. We're focusing on areas that are aligned with our our corporate competencies, I would say, as well as you know the the asset portfolio that we have and, and the businesses uh, that that we have in place. We're currently pursuing a number of renewable fuel initiatives across our downstream that will allow us to deliver more renewable fuel to our customers and really in, in an expanded set of markets. And if you look a little bit longer term, a little bit further out, there's even some larger initiatives that we're currently evaluating. Um, but decisions on those are still very dependent on what happens with evolving regulations like the clean fuel standard as well as market conditions. Uh, but But clearly this is uh, a focus area for us, so I appreciate the question. Okay, and uh, the second question from Manav Gupta from Credit Suisse. Can you talk about benefits of PFT technology at Curl and how it allows you to get higher pricing relative to bitumen? Yeah, thanks for that question, Manav, and and uh, it's exciting to, to talk about PFT. Imperial was the first to deploy PFT technology commercially, uh, and of course that is at our Curl operation. The PFT technolo technology allows us to produce bitumen at a lower cost and a much lower carbon intensity than other oil sands technologies. And as you, you may be aware, um, and this contributes to the advantages, but it, it eliminates the need for an upgrader. And that, of course, significantly reduces capital requirements at the front end, but also operating costs as we go forward. And so once curl bitumen is produced at the site, it of course still needs to be blended with diluent before being shipped via pipeline or rail, but then is sold directly to the market and, and can be run straight in the refineries. Um, so that allows us to achieve prices in line with, uh, with WCS. Um, so, so again, a very favorable technology for us to use at curl. Okay, operator, uh, any other questions on the line? And our last question will come from the line of Dennis Fong from CIDC. You may, you may begin. Hi, good morning, and thanks for taking my, my question. Um, it's just really uh, the, the crux of the question really just focuses around uh, the removal removal, excuse me, of the Alberta government's uh, curtailment policy. And so I was just more so curious as to how, how you're thinking about managing or balancing the thought process of ramping up volumes on your various oil sands facilities versus what could eventually become um, uh, the, the capacity on, on egress and the potential impacts around uh, local pricing, specifically on widening differentials, and how you're planning to moderate or mitigate or balance the thought process of ramping up volumes versus um, versus uh, transporting them to the, the various demand markets. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that question, Dennis. Um, our thought process is very much focused on how do we maximize value uh, for all of our products and you know, and, and what market we direct those uh, those products to is, is driven by uh, what's what's the value at, at the destination coupled with uh, what's the cost of transportation to get it there. Um, and, and for us, we've been able to manage uh, all of the egress uh, for our 
for our uh, for our products. Um, you know, I mean, mainly our, our heavy oil, and um, and so the Alberta government removing the the curtailment quota, you know, just ensures there's there's no other obstacle or limitation to us maximizing production. So, you know, our thought process is very much how do we maximize production from the existing assets? And then given that potential, what are the most economic uh, outlets to place them? And what's the most cost efficient way to get the product to those locations? whether that be a choice of pipelines or, of course, our own rail terminal. And so all of those gives us, you know, advantages and opportunities to optimize. And, and as, as we look forward down the road, we, we are encouraged by the progress that's being made on the pipelines that will, over time, uh, provide even more capacity uh, for shipments. Uh, between Canada and the U.S., and we're obviously very supportive of that. Um, so we don't really see any constraints, but it's all about how do we optimize around it. Thanks for that question, Dennis. Great, thanks. Thank you. And I'm not saying any further questions at this time. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Uh, as always, if you have any follow-up questions or would like any follow-up discussion, don't hesitate to reach out to the IR team here at Imperial. And we look forward to talking again at our upcoming IR Day, which is on November 19th at 8 o'clock Mountain, 10 o'clock Eastern. Thanks, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.